Hi, I'm Daniel Wordsworth. For more than 30 years, I've experienced war zones, natural disasters, refugee camps, and sprawling slums. Now I'm going to show you a better and more optimistic world. This podcast is Finding Good. Well, we're well and truly into season three now, Daniel. Yeah. Of course, if you want to follow along, you can follow Daniel on his socials uh, or go to the website, danielwordsworth.com, ask him many questions. In fact, we've had a lot of questions and a lot of feedback on a previous episode you did in season two. Oh, really? Yeah. The episode was <laughs> Why Leaders Suck. Yeah. Crisis Not Worthy of Our Souls. Um, and you, in that, you had three principles of leadership. Yeah. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, I, <laughs> Hopefully you do. I do. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or did yeah. you make them up on the spot? I have. Uh, I didn't make them up on the spot. I've been having trouble living up to them, right. even though they sound really simple. So rule number one, don't suck. Yeah. Rule number two, be normal. Mm -hmm. Rule number three, take opportunities as they come. Right. And so most of the time I still spend my life in the don't suck category. Right. Mm. So trying not to? Trying not to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like every day you wake up and go, how can I, how can I suck less today? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, 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 every day through the day. It's like a mantra. It must be hard when you, you wake up and you look at the news feed every day and you see leaders all around the world and you go, what, what are you doing? This would be so much simpler if you just – did this or sucked less? Or well, I think it would be so much simpler if they sucked less. I don't always have an answer on what they should be doing. Right. right? But that's their job. That's why they're in that job. Yeah. They're meant to know what to do and yet they're consistently sucking on all fronts. Do they though? Do you, sorry, I'm we're taking a little bit of a detour here at the start of the episode, but do mm. you always know what to do? You mean you're asking me if I always yeah. do? Yeah, well, you're a leader. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, actually... We, I think in another episode we're going to do, I'm going to talk about um, things that we think are true but really aren't. Okay. And one of those I'm going to get into that idea, which is how do you know when you're right, when you think you know what to do? Okay. Because sometimes I think confidence betrays you. Yes. Uh, but, yes, the job is essentially to be right most of the time. And so you've got to have tricks to do that. Okay. Well, let's let's put that aside because we'll go later episode. I'm looking forward to that. But you're talking about tricks to know what to do. Right. As a CEO, <laughs> I'm sure you have a few of them. Yeah, um, yeah. How do you apply what you do in as a chief executive officer, as a leader that people around, not just you, but as CEOs, people around the world look up to CEOs and go, well, you must have it together. You must know what you're doing. You run big mm. organisations. Can you apply anything that you do in that world to life? Yeah, you can. So I, I think there's a whole bunch of hacks that you can apply to your own life. Okay. And so I, what I wanted to talk about today were like five hacks, five CEO hacks for normal life. Have you just decided there's five? Or <laughs> there's, there's five. There's five that I use on the don't suck, in the don't suck area. Okay. Right? So how do you – and the biggest – I think the biggest thing that leaders struggle with is your inner life. Is It's like the person that you are because in the end you're, it, everything that you're doing is just a reflection of who you are in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And so step number one is to take control of yourself. And uh, so these five hacks, they're really about how do you take control of yourself. See, so everyone's a CEO of their own life. Right. So the, here are your hacks for... Taking control of yourself. Beautiful. Yep. So here's the five things you need to do to take control of yourself. <laughs> okay. Shall we count them down? From yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, we'll count them down. So number one, don't worry until it's time to worry. Number two, compartments are your friends. Uh, three, beware the story you're telling yourself. Four, it's never as good or as bad as it seems. Mm -hmm. And five, words matter, but excuses don't. So those are the five things. So okay. I'm, I'll jump in. The first one's real quick, but the first one is the hardest one of all of these. And that is don't worry until it's time to worry. Uh, that's the most important lesson I think you learn as a CEO. So, well, so hang on, but but how do you <laughs> if you if you're worried about something, surely that's the time to worry. Yeah, no, totally, it is not. <laughs> <laughs> you need to explain. That yeah, so I'm going to get as as this episode unfolds, we're going to sort of unpack this because it's like in a it's like in a descending process, meaning. Um, you know, I, how do you do this? You do this. And how do you do this? You do that, right? So there's a sort of a flow that comes with this. But this basic rule, which is don't worry about a thing until the time has come to worry about a thing, that's like every spiritual leader ever has made this point to us. And we all like nod, we all agree, and yet we all really struggle with this one. Mm -hmm. The first question everybody would ask is, so when is the time to worry? Like how do you know when I'm just uh, on a treadmill of worries? Mm -hmm until the time when my worry um, is useful. And I think there's just a simple uh, hack in that. Okay. 
and that is when your thoughts or your worries can lead to an actual action that changes the thing. So when is the time to to start worrying? When your worry produces an action. And yet most of us are stuck in worries for days, weeks, months about things that we have no control over. There's no way that we can actually do anything on that particular day. For example, when you wake up at 3 o'clock at night and you worry about your finances, right? Yeah. Not why you... is it 3 o'clock at night? Yeah, morning? what is that about 3 o'clock? I don't know. But you, you can't actually do anything. And so you've got to somehow take control of your thoughts. And that's a bit of what we're going to talk about in the rest of this episode, which is how do I take control of my thoughts. Okay. Uh, But step number one, we get so caught up in worries every single day. And yet 90% of the time we can do absolutely nothing about the things we're worrying about. And it is entirely a waste of time. We have got to begin to understand um, and sequence how we go about doing this. Like I think there's a – as I've said to you before, I'm out on TikTok and there's like this TikTok guru. Mm -hmm. And he says your worries – are like the instructions the flight attendant gives at the beginning of the flight. When the time comes, you won't remember any of those things and it won't make any difference. <laughs> I had another friend of mine, I, he, was on a, he was on a flight in China and he hopped on the seat and the seat had no seat belts. And so he waved that flight attendant down and said, um, my seat doesn't have a seat belt. And finally there was a flight attendant who was honest. She said, Mr, if we crash, You don't need a (laughs) seatbelt. And so worries are a bit like that. So we have to let our worries go. That's easy to say. So how do you let your worries go? And so here's the second hack. Compartments are your friends. Compartments are your friends. Okay, I get this. Right. Um, So no one likes this one. Like, But here's just the, the truth. Nobody can juggle multiple balls well on a day to day basis. You can't. You have to be able to put your balls down. Yep, you've got to be able to deal. The myriad of things that you're dealing with in your life, you simply can't deal with them all. Multitasking does not work. It doesn't work. And I don't care what gender you are, right? It doesn't work. So the question then is, how do I compartmentalize? So I, I think, and this is, it ties back to this first point. I think there are two things. You have to take some time and you have to realize that worry and anxiety do nothing if they don't lead to action. In fact, it's worse than nothing. It's sucking up your energy, it's causing anxiety, it's affecting your relationships, a whole bunch of things. But I think if you ask yourself, if you look inside and say, do I actually believe that my anxiety, my worry, does nothing at all? And I think most people would say, no, surely it does something. Yep. And I'm gonna, in the third hack, I'm gonna talk about why we think that. But it doesn't do anything. So first one. And then the second but, bit. But that, that's, that's, sorry to interrupt you. That's anxiety yeah. caused by worry. We're not talking about people with generalized anxiety disorders or anything. No, no, we're not talking about any but of that. that. That's an anxiety caused by waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning going, oh, my God, how am I going to pay that bill, right? That's, you, can't, you can't affect that in that moment. Yeah, so, so you're, yes, your worry and your, uh, the ruminating that you're doing doesn't produce an action, so it, you've just got to let it go. Yeah. But even in the day, I think sometimes we feel like I've got this to do, I've got this to do, I've got this to do. You know, we do these lists and we, I've got this to do and we're constantly reminding ourselves of all the things to do and we're not able to be present in a particular moment. And so one way to become present is simply to look at something and say, look at that issue. For me, that may be, for example, I have a board meeting coming up in a month's time. Yep. Or I may be about to go on a trip or a... Uh, uh, you know, in another, in a few weeks' time, and then I start ruminating on that. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? All that kind of thing. So what I try to do is I look at the issue and say, is now the relevant time to work on this? And if the answer is no, then I put it, I, I mentally actually put it in a box and I put it to the side and say, I'm going to get to this later, mm. but I'm going to focus on today. This idea of, I think we've been, taught that there's something wrong with compartmentalizing and I get it in the personal life like you said around personal anxieties around past trauma that may all be true I can't speak to that Mm. but what I can say is if you're somebody like a CEO and there's a hundred things you have to do if you're walking around every day thinking about those hundred things you get you're not performing in any particular area well it's basic law of focus isn't it if you're focused on more than one thing you're not really focused so if and if you're thinking well um how do I manage this sort of constant flow of thoughts? 
because that's what's keeping us out of the compartment is this constant flow, never-ending flow of thoughts. So I, I think what I would say is what we have to do first bit is realize that it doesn't have to be this way. That, that I think most of us spend our whole life with flow, you know, this sort of thoughts going constantly, constantly yeah. is our habit. So we step one, you say, actually, it doesn't need to be that way. And then, then I think there's a deeper question to ask, which is maybe you've lost control of your thought life. That actually, in my experience, most people have lost control of their thought life. Their thoughts are, are literally just like a, um, on crazy cycle. Mm. And I think what happens is you can become addicted to these and you can become addicted particularly to negative thinking. It's not like anyone is locked into a constant flow of positive thoughts. Right? That doesn't yeah. happen. No. So what we're talking about is worries, concerns, anxieties, reminders of all the dreadful things you've done in the past, all the <laughs> embarrassing moments you've ever had. They're constantly rolling around. So you can be addicted to negative thoughts like this in the same way you can be addicted to smoking or addicted to eating donuts. Mm -hmm. And I think a way to deal with it is very similar, meaning if you've been addicted to smoking or you're, um, you're addicted to food, the, I think the cravings are like 90 seconds, between 30 to 90 seconds. Yeah. You've only got to, for that length of time, um, ride it out and then you'll get through it. Uh, but that I think takes us to the third point, which is beware the story you're telling yourself. So I think the other thing that we don't realize is that negative thoughts are an infinite resource. They, they don't require batteries or they don't require, like you could, if you could stay awake 24 hours a day, you could literally be thinking negative thoughts that whole time. Yeah. Yep. They're an infinite resource. They have no natural end to them. And so as long as you keep thinking about them, they will keep on coming. And the other thing about it is I think that we think that surely if I keep thinking about this, I can resolve it. But negative thoughts are never resolved by constant thinking. And uh, so you can, you can do a test about this. Like it's what's easier to think about, negative thoughts or positive thoughts? And uh, it's actually like a treadmill. So you've got to, like any treadmill, you've got to get off. You're not going to outrun the treadmill. You know, the treadmill is not going to get yeah. to some point and just say, I've, I've had it, I'm stopping now. So, so if, you, if you're in an endless loop of negative thoughts, you have to find something else to focus on. To do that, I think there are like two things that I do, which is I remind myself, and, and I, again, I've found this with a lot of people when I talk about this, there is this belief that there's something good comes from all this. Like there must be some reason why I'm thinking about this. There must be something. I actually think it's like donuts and cigarettes, meaning I think it provides some level of comfort that even though I'm not doing anything about it, the fact that I'm thinking about it is surely a good thing. I'm not, yeah. I, it, I'm not ignoring it yeah. or being apathetic or something else. But actually it doesn't work that way. If you're holding a belief that these, this constant ruminating and constant thoughts are actually helping you in any way at all, and I'm trying to be really definite like that. If the, if the thoughts that you have can't produce an action right now, it's a waste of time to be worrying about it. It's a waste of time. I used to have a CFO in my last organization. Every Friday afternoon, he would come in at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. And he would tell me, we're in a financial crisis. I don't think we're going to make it through the next week. We're not going to make payroll on Tuesday. He would do this for months. Have a nice weekend. And then he would say, you know, <laughs> and then I would be like all weekend, sleepless, constantly thinking about this. And then after a few months of this, I said to him, why do you come in every Friday and give me some catastrophe that's about to happen? Because I'm not sleeping, I'm not doing anything. And he said, well, I'm afraid that you'll just over the weekend, like lose your focus. Like <laughs> he was worried that I wouldn't. He thought the only way I could take this stuff seriously was if he panicked me every Friday afternoon and then I had two days of absolute panic and then on Monday I could begin working on this and it was crazy. The best thing that ever happened to me was that guy leaving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you think in an organisation people, if they see a calm leader, they get concerned? They're like, what has he got to be calm about? I think it's the opposite. There's nothing worse that if, if you're in an organization, your leader's crying. Yeah. One, that's a real <laughs> negative thing. The leader starts crying. Constantly. Yeah. 
<laughs> but also running around, uh, and, really and, negative look, yeah. looking like you're panicked, any of that stuff. You actually, as a leader, I think, want to go the opposite way. You want to be the person that's always smiling. Now, I'm not great at this. My resting face is not a smiling face. Oh, no. I think my resting face is smiling, but it's apparently not. Oh, you got resting angry face. I got resting angry face, a worried face. But no, I think people want you to be looking, don't you think, like upbeat? Happy, smiling, yeah, unless you're in the middle of something if bad. If you're in a crisis. No, then you need to look like you've got an appropriate grasp of the situation. Yeah. But no crying. So maybe he felt you were in a crisis and you weren't giving it its dues. Yeah, but how long are three months of crisis? Yeah. Now, in some ways we were, but again, the point I would say there is how did it help me to spend all my Saturday and Sunday worrying about that? There was literally nothing I could do. In fact, what it did is it drove my energy levels right down because I wasn't sleeping. It sounds like that was his worry and he was just giving you the monkey on his back to take for the weekend. Yeah, I think he was just saying we need to share this. Yeah, yep, we need to share this and I'm worried that you are not taking this sufficiently seriously because you've got a smile on your face on a Friday and I need to wipe that smile right off your face. So we can, can we apply that worry thing and the compartmentalising thing for a second to, to real life? So I was speaking to someone over the weekend who you know was saying to me, oh, my God, this is – I can't handle it at the moment. There's so much to be worried about in the world. You know, mm. We spoke about this in the first episode of this season. There's so much to be worried about in this world and they used the situation in the Middle East as one example mm -hmm. and then the cost of living as another example and a few other things happening in their life. And I said, well, and out of their control. I was like, well, surely what you're taking in is, is up to you. If you're opening your feet every morning and you're seeing all these negative news stories and wars have always been going on. There's always been problems in the Middle East and I'm not belittling them but or minimising them but these things have always happened but all of a sudden now you have this focus on your phone every day and it feeds you all this information. Mm. So there's nothing you can impact right now mm -hmm. that's going to change any of those things. So surely you've got to adjust what goes in because the input creates the worry as well, don't you? Does, does it not? It's how you receive that input. So I think Stephen Covey has a good way of thinking about this. So he talks about three spheres that we have in our life. So you, the middle sphere, the inner sphere, is your sphere of control. The next sphere is your sphere of influence. And then the third sphere is the sphere of there be dragons. Yeah, like freak out sphere. Yeah. So when a person is talking about the Middle East... They're living in that um, freak-out sphere. And in that sphere, you have nothing. You neither have control, nor do you even have influence over it. Mm. So living in that space, this is an example again of don't worry about the time till the time's come to worry about it. There's no good thing that comes from it. So you've got only a choice of one of two things. Either you let it go, and that's what we're, part of what we're talking about is here, how do you take control of your thoughts? How do you use words better? those kinds of things. Or you bring it in to your sphere of influence or your sphere of control. What I decided early on in my career was there was a lot of things happening in the world and I didn't want to just observe them from afar. I wanted to pull them into my sphere of influence. So in my current capacity and what I've done for the last 25 years is move as many of those things that keep me up and keep me anxious, like a crisis in the Middle East, uh, a drought somewhere, a conflict somewhere, a war somewhere, I want to do something about it. And so I try to pull it into my sphere of influence. And because I work for World Vision, I can actually have an influence yeah. on what's happening in the Middle East, what's happening in Ukraine, what's happening on the Amazon. But I think that's where we have to weigh up those things. Is this in my control? My family, my job, my immediate life, my immediate community, is this in my influence? Uh, can I actually do something to actually make a change? And if the answer is no, it's in that third sphere. We've got to find a way to take control of your inner life and that's what we're talking about now. So in your work, you'll have seen people in in crisis innumerable times. Mm -hmm. Have you seen them apply this sort of, not obviously in your five hack way, but have you seen them apply this way of thinking? Like you've seen mothers with starving children and their immediate worry and need is the thing they can have impact on the most. They're not worried about anything outside of that, right? Yeah, if your child is at risk your whole existence has narrowed down to one thing. Outside of that, though, uh, as we've talked about in other episodes, you know, you're worried and concerned about a whole range of things that are affecting your family, affecting your children's long-term future. You're, you're, you're looking at all of that. I don't suppose I've thought about this so much, about people in crisis, how do they apply those three areas? I think often when people are 
displaced, when they're refugees, when they're deciding to make a move, I think that's where they're deciding to live in the circle of influence. They're saying, I can't do anything about the bombing that's happening in my city, so I can decide to move and to go somewhere else. So I think we do this. I don't think most of those folks would have had a framework like this to think through, though. No, but it, but it yeah. occurs sort of almost by necessity. The more and more chaos that exists around you, the more and more control that you seek to exert in your own life. So I, I think that's real. Mm -hmm. That's real. I think a part of the way you can do that is I think, and it gets to this point, in order to take control of your thoughts, I think the first point is to go into that inner circle of control and just ask some basic and very practical questions, such as, am I living a life that's fulfilling to me? And do I have at least one area of my life that's fulfilling to me? We may not have it in every area. We may have it in our kids. We may have it in our work. We may have it in the work service we give to our community. You can't necessarily have fulfillment in every aspect of your life. But is there a part of my life that I think is has meaning? I think the second question is, are my finances basically in order? If you don't have control over your basic finances, nothing good comes of that. Yep, that's high anxiety. The third one are you um, exercising? That's a key one. Yeah. Like just moving, just go for a walk for 45 minutes a day or do something. Like the best exercise is the one you'll do. You just find one that you'll do. Maybe it's a 45 minute walk. Are you surrounded by people who are positive and who build you up or are you surrounded by negative people? So I, I think if you just get those things in, in order, one area of meaning, decent friends around me or family, exercising, and uh, sleeping well, actually, if I get that stuff in order, that's my little control sphere, then I think you can begin moving into the influence one. Um, so you have to start building a new story. And so the last bit I would say on the thoughts one, thing that I would emphasize is you can't resolve negative thoughts. You have to simply replace them with something else, yeah? a, new, a new set of things, which gets to the fourth hack, which is it's never as good or it's never as bad as it seems. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a, I've, and I have, it doesn't leave me a much place to go. It <laughs> there's no questions. I'm not going to worry about this, but I'm also not going to be happy about it. Yeah, yeah. That's what So happens. you just maintain an even kill. <laughs> even kill. Well, I, you know what? The other thing I've noticed, so sometimes when you're the CEO, and it's not so much here, but in my previous life, at one stage I thought that I'd wrecked the whole organization. <laughs> Like I thought I'd like... Is it, had you told this to the CFO that no, was walking well, in Well, I had a new CFO that was like a really calm one. But then one Friday he comes in and says, I think we may have wrecked the whole organisation. Right. <laughs> and this is like two and a half thousand staff. Now, these are staff in places like South Sudan or, or Darfur or... Like if you can't pay their salaries, mm. they're doomed. And so I, d I went back and I had like... Um, I had weeks of this... I used to sometimes wake up, honestly, yeah, I still get shivers thinking about it, like in the middle of the night with a silent scream thinking, I've just condemned two and a half thousand people to nothing and no food and all of their family members. And that was such a bad feeling. And then I had one time I had staff kidnapped. But then good things would happen. Like I've mentioned on the podcast, we got that call from the uh, Drucker Foundation that would won the award and... And then getting offered a CEO job is like, great. It's an like, amazing moment. Mm. But what I've also noticed is, and I remind myself of this, the bad feels much worse than the good feels good. The bad feels much worse. I don't know what it is about human beings. Like even now as I think about this, I'm remembering I did this speech about 10 years ago that totally bombed. And so even the moment when I think about bad things, I'm remembering myself standing up there on stage and all these people looking at me like, <laughs> that was terrible. It's probably some kind of primal survival. That we had to, yeah, because right? nothing good comes from good, but no. something real bad can come from bad. Yeah. And uh, I've done actually what I talked about I've done on the podcast. That's the one about, you know, when I went to the shamans and I found the two meaning to life, yeah. right? The humans are wondrous. We all come with a gift. I thought it was like super awesome. And everybody was just like, that's just like really boring and sucks. <laughs> and I thought, if this is you, totally you. But the horror of the feeling, I, st I can feel it right now as I'm talking about. So here's the thing. So that horror you feel and that shame you feel and everything else is like an accelerant. And the only way you can bust out of that, this is the problem with the, the fact that negative so much 
more worse and it feels so much worse and it's so much longer is that's what f- is the accelerant to the negative thoughts that I was talking about. Okay. It's got so much gas in it, so much energy in it. It can last years. So you have to, if you want to have positive thoughts, positive thoughts have nothing. Like they'll last an hour and then you're like moved on. And so that's why people cultivate a routine of gratitude. Because what you're doing in a, with a routine of gratitude is you're like... Living in the li- And you're winding it up. You're giving it energy. So you wake up in the morning, what am I grateful? There are three things that I'm grateful for. Yeah. At the end of the day, what are three things that have, I'm grateful for this? Uh, in my life, what am I grateful for? It, in a sense, you're injecting energy into those things to give that those positive things um, some longevity mm-hmm. in the way that you're thinking about it. Uh, and what I'd say uh, last on this is never as good or as bad as it seems is something that I hold all the time because sometimes really things are really bad and then I think it's going to be okay, I'm going to get through this, it's not as bad as it seems. And even when something's good, I know it's this is going to be fleeting, I'm going to be back into those other things, I have to remember this as a thing of uh, gratitude for me. But what I also realise is this, our worst fears rarely, rarely come true. And even when they come true, all the worrying in the world didn't help. Yep, didn't help. And I think as it will take me to the last hack. And I found this is one that everybody thinks that Americans are good at this and Australians don't like this. We're sort of suspicious of it. And that's that words matter and excuses don't. And this, I think because of my Australian culture, it took me years to realise this. The type of words, because it feels like um, superficial, But the type of words and phrases that we say in our head or the type of uh, words and phrases that we say out loud actually matter. And in a strange way, they become a reality. I used to go around and I would say things like, this is so hard or I'm feeling so overwhelmed or this is so difficult. When you say that stuff, it just becomes that way. So you've got to actually get out of that. And the way to get out of that and maybe it's chicken and egg, right? It may ha- be hard. I'm not saying that things that are not hard or that something may not be overwhelming or challenging or unfair or anything else. But it, saying those phrases does absolutely nothing for you. And instead, and this is the bit that I think people will think will sound American, but we have to say things like, I'm so excited to try this, right? Uh, this is a great opportunity. I think I can beat this. This is going to be amazing, even when it's clearly not going to be. People tend to push away from that sort of fake optimism. Mm. Yeah. Well, don't they? Like, That's like, what I'm oh, getting at. Well, you know, oh, doesn't work. Well, oh, yeah. you, everything's yeah, great yeah. and the world's wonderful. Yeah. And if you think positive, then you'll be positive. Yeah. But it, there's something in it. I'm saying, yeah, for years I thought that. And then I had a coach once and she just said, stop all these phrases. Like, all you, you keep bringing up, this is very difficult or this is very hard. And she said, I don't, and then I said, but they are. And she was, I don't even care about any of that. But you can also replace this is to I'm feeling. I'm feeling like this is hard right now. I'm feeling overwhelmed so in this moment. What I would be saying is you can say that. It ain't no – nothing good's going to come from that. Okay. I mean if you want to have a, a pity party for 20 seconds, you know, <laughs> just go sit in the room, cry about it, right? <laughs> but we're, we're living in a culture at the moment that rewards that kind of thinking and that kind of speech. Yeah, there's always a reason why something can't happen. That's the other thing you realise about – that's my point about – like words matter – and I mean they literally matter, that if you just use negative words in your life, you're just going to be a negative person and everything's going to be hard. And I, don't, I didn't think it would be that way, but it totally is that way because this coach just said, just start saying more positive things. I just became a more positive person. I just did. And things that seemed hard weren't all that hard anyway. There's so much in our life that just, it's just not hard compared to others. It's just not hard compared to others. And somebody might say, well, it's easy for you, Daniel. You're a white, cisgen, middle-aged, whatever. But my thing to them would be, did that help you saying that? Like, it may be true of me, mm. but did that help you saying that? Right? Does your situation change uh, when you made that point? So words are powerful and no excuses. You learn this real quick as a CEO. No one cares about your excuses. In fact, any time a leader makes an excuse, people judge you. They just do. There's never a reason to make an excuse. Even the people say, I'm not making an excuse, I'm giving a reason. I don't even give those. I go, yep, that was wrong. I'll uh, fixing it by doing X and tomorrow it won't happen again like That's this. That's taking ownership though. What? Excuses are not. 
Yeah, not taking ownership, yeah. Or, and, and there's like all these other things. But I think what I'm getting at is there's a real practicality on it. Just stop making excuses. There is always a reason why you can't do a thing and then there's always a reason why you can. I, I found with pros and cons lists, if you know what you want to do, the pros are much longer than the cons. If you don't want to do it, the cons always end up being longer than the pros. And if you're not sure, they're both equal. So just pick the pros. Just go with it. And so no excuses and just use better words. Uh, they, and I do think there are two types of people in the world. <laughs> <laughs> you love numbers. You love, you love listing things off. Those that tell you why they can't do a thing, yeah. those that tell you why they can and uh, in, in my experience, I've never met a successful person that's in the first category. Why I can't do a thing. Never met one. But those are my five hacks. Okay, so for anyone playing along at home or in the car and they don't have a pen and a pad, give me the five hacks again. So first of all, the hacks are all about taking control of your inner life, right? Taking control of yourself. So there are five. One, don't worry until the time has come to worry. Two, Compartments are your friends. Three, beware the story that you're telling yourself. Four, it's never as good or it's never as bad as it seems. And five, words matter, but excuses don't. You've got one more in you, surely. I can give you my bonus hack that I give to my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> Fraser's gift with purchase. Yeah. Bonus hack, I like it. This is the steak knives yep. that goes with this. <laughs> I don't know if this is a CEO hack, but it's the one that I give to my daughter. In fact, in the car on the way here, she's with me at the moment, I, we actually use this hack. Okay. Yeah. Which is if you want to get something, you just need to be two things. Be direct and be polite. Be direct and be polite. So by direct, I mean if you want something, you should ask awesome. for it. I think we get caught up, particularly, you know, CEOs in the workplace, we read that stuff, you know, The Prince by Machiavelli, we, or we read uh, Robert Greene's 48 Rules of Power, mm. and, and we think that everything's like a grand chessboard, and a lot of people you meet, they think they're playing this grand chess game, and I've just found that it's much easier to play checkers, and the way to play checkers is just be direct. Yeah, people struggle with directness, though. People they're, struggle to be direct because, uh, you know, it's, it's, it can be confrontational to ask something directly. As children, you know, I mean, I, I, well, I teach my kids, we teach our kids, you know, don't ask, don't get. So if you want something, you should ask for it. Ask for it. But also when you are direct back to someone, quite often they can feel like you're being uh, aggressive. So that's where I add the second bit, which is be nice about it. Like be uh, gentle, be kind. At worst, just be normal as you say it. So don't speak with an aggressive tone. Uh, tone down the directness in some way. But, but I've, I've found that... We what, smile as we speak. You can <laughs> smile. What I've found is that normally people are good at one of either of those two. So there's a, like I have somebody in my family and she will tell you all the time that she's direct. And that just means that she just tells you things that you don't want to know over and over again. Yep. yep, you're fat, you're ugly, you're whatever it is, right? And then she says, hey, I'm just, you know what you know those people? Teller. I'm a truth teller. <laughs> I just tell it as it is. Those people are the worst. Yeah, those people are the worst. I just tell it as it is. I, go, I didn't want to know your view at all on that. <laughs> so I'm not, when I talk about being direct, I'm not talking about that. It's like this thing about feedback. You're like, you're, the only feedback that's useful is the feedback you are ready to hear. You don't want to get all this other stuff. So you have to be direct and particularly when you're dealing with people that are busy, et cetera, just telling them what you want is key, but just saying it in a nice way. And that's a lot of other people are not direct at all and that they think by being nice and they think by being accommodating that the other person is somehow going to read your mind and realize what you want and get to it. And that's like people pleasing. Is there subtext here? What yeah, am I what, what am I, is that, and, and you, the person's thinking, I'm being pretty clear about this. Yeah. And they're absolutely not being clear about it. So if you, that's, I suppose my bonus hack would be my special daughter edition version, which is whatever you want in life, you should ask for it, be direct. They may say no, by the way, but you can ask for it. Yeah. And then secondly, but do it in a gentle, kind, open, smiling way. And if you do those two things, uh, I think you will leap over all the chess players. People don't like to hear no. That's another reason why they don't ask questions directly. They don't want to hear no. I don't like to be told no, yeah. Yeah, so the other thing you've got to be willing is for the other person to be direct and polite and they'll just say no, um, but I would like to do this for you, but no, I can't. But at least you know. 
Um, and that's great. Thank you. I, I'm interested to talk about the things you think are true but actually aren't, which we'll get into in the next episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. Don't forget, if you've got a question for Daniel or you'd like to comment on anything he said, danielwordsworth.com, there's a comment section there. Or on the socials as well. You can follow me along, Daniel Wordsworth. We'll talk to you next time. Thanks, Fitz.